Monthly scheduled meeting of December 15th, 2022. I'm Joey Hargis, Metro Zoning Administrator, and I'll be uh, presenting the cases for review in today's public hearing. I uh, would ask at this time if you've got a cell phone, if you don't mind putting it on silent or vibrate so as not to disrupt our proceedings, we'd appreciate it. The procedure today will be to introduce the case record for each case as the Codes Administration has it. We'll do that on the wall here by means of a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'll go through all the slides and photographs and sketches that uh, for the cases that will be heard today. And then after the end of my presentation, uh, I'll call if there's any opposition present. Uh, if there is not opposition present, the applicant will come forward to the table here. There's four seats there in front of you. Uh, if you'll push the button just to the right of the microphone uh, one time and your light ring will come on like mine is right here. Identify yourself, uh, name and address, and present your case. Uh, after the applicant goes, the opposition will come forward and present their testimony. Uh, the board's rules allow for cases without opposition five minutes for the applicant to present their case. And that five minutes includes testimony time. It, it clock does stop for questions and answers uh, that the board might have for you. Uh, in cases with opposition, both the opposition and the appellant will have 10 minutes per side. So that's not per speaker. If there are multiple speakers for a case, you will, guys will need to divide up your 10 minutes time before you come up. Um, and then just uh, where you're sitting at the table there, just to your right on the shelf, you'll see a clock with the red LED lights. That'll keep track of your time that's there. The board will go through all cases set for public hearing today, and after each case, the board will discuss and vote on the case in front of you. Uh, the board's vested with the powers to act under Section 1740-180 of the Metro Code of Law. Um, before we begin, uh, some preliminary announcements. Uh, are there any council members present who wish to address the board before the hearing begins. I don't see any present, Mr. Chairman. A couple preliminary announcements. Um, we've had some cases that have withdrawn their case. Let me go over those cases now. The following cases have withdrawn their case from the board and will not be hear heard today. The first case uh, withdrawn will be case 2022-167 uh, Nashville West End, the owner, 1801 West End Avenue. Uh, this case uh, is being withdrawn by staff the uh, a review of the, the sign filing, the sign actually complies with the code, and so we're going to issue that, that sign permit. And the um, second case withdrawn by the applicant is case 2022-168, uh, Broderick Builders at 1001 Percy Warner Boulevard. Are there any parties present uh, either in support or opposition for either cases 167 on West End and 168? Okay. Seeing none, um, that's my first preliminary announcement. My second are deferrals requested by the applicants in two cases. Uh, the first of those two cases that will be deferred till January 5th, which is our first meeting in 2023, is case 2022-145. Uh, Aqui Hines is the appellant at 3706 Clarksville Pike. Are there any parties present for case 145? Mr. Chairman, I see none. Again, that case will be heard January the 5th. 1 p.m. And the second case, uh, have a deferral request, is case 2022-166, uh, Frank Spitznagel at 314 East Trinity Lane, uh, requesting a postponement until January the 5th. Are there any parties present for case 166? All right, Mr. Chairman, seeing none. Uh, go ahead and proceed with consent agenda. The board does have a consent agenda. And prior to the meeting today, the chairman reviews the cases uh, on the record and if the, the applicant meets the criteria for a variance and that uh, testimony would not alter the material facts, uh, Mr. Pepper uh, recommends the case. The following case is for consent to the remainder of the board for approval. If you're here in opposition to any of the cases I call going forward, please raise your hand. Uh, let me identify you. We'll pull the case from consent. We'll hear it in its regular order. Uh, the first case recommended for consent is case 2022-156, Jacob Van Hooser, 902 and 904 Douglas Avenue. Are there any parties here in opposition to the case on Douglas Avenue? Any parties opposed? All right, I do see a hand. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll hear that case, and it's uh, that will be the first case heard here once we get started. Uh, so we'll pull that case from consent. 
the uh, next case recommended uh, for consent, Mr. Chairman, is our final case, uh, case 2022-169, uh, 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 Samil Gultrip as the appellant at 9 192 Duke Street. Are there any parties opposed to the case at Duke Street? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see none. Uh, that is your consent agenda case for today, case 169. Sir, if you're here for case 169, your case has been granted. You are free to go. Uh, I always extend the invitation like I do. You're welcome to stay with us and hang out. Um, but no one ever takes us up on that. So, All right, our first case that will be heard today will be case 2022-156, Jacob Van Hooser, the appellant, uh, Baylor Investment Group, LLC, owner of the property is located at 902 and 904 Douglas Avenue. They are requesting a variance from the street setback requirements in the R6 UZO district. The appellant is seeking to construct uh, detached duplexes at the property. Referred to the board under section 1712030, the appellant has alleged jurisdiction under section 1740180 item B. Uh, it, is the appellant present? In this case, okay, come on forward, sir, and have a seat. Uh, I'll go through our case record first. You'll have 10 minutes to present your case uh, after I'm done with with with, um, with my presentation. And give me just a moment. I'll get that queued up here. As I said, first case today, case 2022-156. The um, subject property is located on the south margin of Douglas Avenue. You see the zoning map and actually involves the, the parcels um, listed. I don't know if you can see my, sorry, apologize. Forget you guys can't see my pointer. This would be the subject property bound in red here, the exterior. Again, the subject property with aerial photograph uh, looking toward the north on Douglas Avenue. Subject property does have a stream located to the rear of the property. Again, zoning map with the uh, stream floodplain overlay. And then a view looking at the subject lot today um, facing south on Douglas Avenue Next photograph um, shows the, the view of the property from the south margin of Douglas Avenue looking into the site. Then a view along Douglas Avenue toward the west. And this is the uh, site plan submitted by the applicants. Uh, this site plan shows if the um, setbacks were applied as required by the zoning ordinance. Again, a reminder to the board members, our setbacks in, in these zone districts are the contextual setback and is the average of the four closest residences to the property here. You see he's, he's listed out those residences. And then the contextual setback of 29 feet. The applicant's proposing in the site plan here submitted it, their actual proposal survey at 13.2 feet. <coughs> so they're requesting a reduction of setback from, from 29 down to 13.2. And I'll leave this site plan up uh, for the appellant. And, sir, if you'll give me just a second, I'll get the clock reset, and we'll let you start and identify yourself. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jacob Van Hooser, uh, the owner of this property. And could you give us your address for the record? Oh, sorry. The, yeah. My my home address or this home address is fine. Home address is eight eleven Lishy Avenue um, in East Nashville. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. Um, but I, I purchased this property. That current structure is a is like a dilapidated structure. It's been uninhabited for over a decade. Um, it's falling down. It, it, I mean, it, it really was sold as a piece of land because it couldn't be inhabited. So the plan, it, w like we bought it to tear it down eventually, and and we were hope in hopes to be able to build something. Um, We've fought the battle with the stream on the back. We, we don't, we're not really trying to argue that, but because of that stream buffer, it pushes everything to the front. 
uh, the property. And that's why on that street that it does the the house setbacks changes because that stream kind of runs along, not quite parallel, but almost parallel with Douglas Avenue. So. It's hard to go the average of all, you know, I think it was eight properties or, or four, I, I don't know the exact zoning, but we were just trying to maintain the current, like our new properties would be able to stay where the current house is at. We're not trying to go any further forward or anything like that. We're just trying to stay where it's at because otherwise with the new setback would push us back. It would be completely unbuildable to do anything. And then we just would have to leave it as is or... I mean, you just couldn't do anything. So we're, I'm, I'm hoping that we can just keep the setback currently where it is. It's in line pretty much with the house, as you can see from the other picture. It's in line with the house on the right and pretty close. I think it's within five feet of the house on the left. And so it's, it's not where we're trying to go, you know, overly far and, you know, encroach on the road or the sidewalk. Um, that's, that's really all I have. I mean, I, I don't, if you guys have any questions. Sure, we, there may be some board members with questions. I don't have any, any board members with questions. Okay, well, to it, you're going to have some time left for a rebuttal if you want it, okay. um, probably at least several minutes. So we'll, we'll hear from, uh, there is a, a lady okay. who wanted to speak to. Yeah. So. Do I go sit back there? You can, please, okay. yeah, if you would. Yep. Thank you. Okay, if the parties uh, who are opposed or have questions would like to come forward, please come forward to the uh, front table there. Are there any other parties uh, present who wish to speak on this case? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I see none. Uh, Miss, you'll have uh, 10 minutes to present your uh, testimony to the board. And... Yep, we're all set. Okay. Uh, I live on uh, Laurent Street. My name is Brenda Christian, and I'm not opposing anything, as I said, but I just want to make sure that, and like he said, there is a creek that runs down the back of my property. And if uh, Douglas sets up, and I don't want a big, tall building or anything to where that water's going to run down because we already flood. There is a tree at the present time leaning on my fence, tearing my fence down from one of those properties up there. I can't say which one it is because I don't go on anybody's property. One of the trees have failed, and it messed up my home on the back end, and I had to get that fixed. But at the same time, like I said, I'm not opposing anybody doing anything, but I just don't want to be flooded out any more than I am. Can you tell us on this um, image here where your home is? Is it to the left or the right of the pink? Okay, he's on Douglas Street side, and I'm behind that. Behind. Oh, so down. So I would be behind him. Okay. okay thanks. So, ma'am, what we, what we can assure you is that we, we don't have anything to do with the stormwater, but this will have to be approved by stormwater. And okay, and it's I just tried not, to go through all of them. What about the trees? Because they're on mm -hmm. that side of the fence. They're not right. on my side. They're on Douglas' side. And I think it's probably on that property in the back. I don't know how far the property goes, but like I said, one has crushed one side of my home, and I've had it fixed. And one is leaning on my fence now, tearing it down, where the fence, where the tree fell from that side. Okay. And I, I hate to give you more bad news about what we can't do, but we can't help you with a tree either, because all we can do today is decide whether or not this applicant has a hardship that warrants a variance. That's the only question before us. I don't know what to tell you about the trees other than probably talk to your council person or... And I've tried to talk to them okay. too. Well, I don't. Uh, okay. okay. That's just not something we can help you with, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I just wanted but, to make sure. Okay. Well, and thank I just you don't for, want to be flooded out. Thank you for your time and your questions. And, huh? I said thank you for your time and okay. questions. No yeah. problem. <clears throat> okay. If the appellant would like to come back, um, yeah. address anything that may have been presented. I just told her if, if the tree is an issue, I'll, I'll take care of it. I, I'm not unaware of whether that tree is on my property, but I'll go there and find out. Okay. I'll take care of that for her. And, um, that would be yeah, great. We, we'd have no problem. We have no issues with the current f f 
stream buffers, we shouldn't be affecting any drainage. And like you said, they'll approve anything that we have sure. from that standpoint. Um, well, if you could talk to her about the trees, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. take care of it right now. Okay. Uh, any further questions from board? Okay, we have none. Thank you, sir. I, I, we'll, I, thank oh, you. He does. I'm Mr. Lawless has one, a question. One particular question. Okay. Can you articulate for the record what your hardship is? I think, it, I think it's pretty obvious, but we need to get it on the record, okay. if you would, please. The hardship is that because of the, the stream buffer has increased from what even the, um, what it was, I mean, I guess several years ago, and that has pushed the property, like the only building envelope up so far that if you actually have the actual current setback from the street, it leaves no envelope to build at all on either of these properties or without really having a very angle, I mean, very, you know, very difficult property to build if, if you could even build anything. So, any further questions? No. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody want to lead so, us off? So, for clarification, we can't dictate the removal of trees at that back property line. I think that these are fallen, as I understand it, these are fallen trees that have fallen over a fence. I don't, if we can, that's, um, yeah, I don't mean, I view our job as we approve the variance or we don't approve the variance. I don't, um, I don't think, I mean, our, our council can weigh in on that, but I don't think with, I, I don't think it's within our purview to, to get into removing trees. I'd agree with the chair. I think you're probably, it's probably a little too far afield to have an exaction to require that. I know we, we've made, you know, some stipulations on making sure trees are replaced. Um, so, you, you, I just don't understand how this is necessarily... We, we can require it if they're going to start removing some trees. We can... Sorry. Yeah, I think I think if the tree was removed as part of the build out, that might. Miss then we can jump in there and get some anything but a hackberry. <laughs> so since the trees aren't being, uh, I guess, displaced due to the building, it's not in our purview. Got you. All right. Noted. And, and I think, Mr. Cole, the the the. Uh, Lady that had a concern about that, I had her. I saw her having a follow-up conversation with Applewood that looked like they were communicating pretty well. So hopefully, we we managed to collaterally resolve that. Um, mm. yeah. Do you want to try to articulate the hardship that's not financial in nature? Right? Sure. I think there's a there's a. Um, a required buffer zone there for that's uh, quite large, and I also I'm looking at what the encroachment is. I mean, and the applicant's going to have to go get permission from. Uh, I'm assuming get permission from stormwater to, to intrude into that buffer a little bit, but. Uh, I mean, I think a 50 foot buffer is a pretty. Pretty, pretty, pretty hefty hardship as I see it. Uh, he still has to have approval through stormwater. And yes. Yeah, and I think there's a little. I think that he, he's even uh, going to have to get approval of the, the encroachments into the buffer zone. We can't. We cannot approve that. So. Well, we can require some trees. I think we always have that. Uh, I think what we're, you know, we do have that priority. I did not hear him. I, I heard what I heard were some trees are, were down. I don't know whether it was a result of their, I'm assuming they haven't started any kind of site work, but. Uh, and, and the applicant just indicated, shaking his head left to right, that they haven't started any site work. Okay. I'm sure he's going to want to put some trees in there of some type to keep soil erosion from happening so that that wouldn't be something he would object to if we put that on there. I would think. Do we have no problem? <laughs> you I wanna, just broke the rules a little bit there. Sure. No, you, that's fine. Do you want to make a motion with a, it sounds like with a condition or two, maybe? Uh, maybe, maybe. 
Yes, sir, I do. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve the variance with a provision that any trees that are removed are replaced by similar, as long as they're not hack areas, trees to aid in soil erosion and all that other type of ad. And I don't know what it is. Mr. Cole, you want to help me out here, dude? We're calling for the replacement. Yeah, replacement of trees, similar size. I wonder if placement, location of the trees can be impacted to, to limit erosion and, and water drainage to other properties. My, my concern about similar size would be what if there's a, a right in the middle of the property, there's a, you know, 50, 40 year old <clears throat> elm. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think he's, you're not going to be able to go out and get a 40-year-old elm. That would be my only concern. Yeah. I have a suggestion. There's Please. an urban forester in Metro Nashville. Maybe he can review approve it. and approve yeah, and I make like recommendations. Yes. I like All right, I okay. So do you, is that your motion would be to approve with? Condition upon sign off by the urban forester, urban forester and well, we don't have anything to do with the uh, uh, water runoff, but that's, that's up to another area. So I would and remove the dead and damaged trees. Second. Okay, do we have a second? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Uh, okay. Looks like that passes. Did, did y'all vote? No, no. You with stuff. Okay. All opposed? Okay, so that passes 4-0. 5-0. 5-0, sorry, 5-0. Okay. All right, so thank you, sir. Okay. Our next case is nine May appeal. The uh, next case is 2022-160. Miss Melanie Weber uh, is the appellant and owner of the property located at 946 Batterfield Drive, requesting an item A appeal and challenging the zoning administrator's interpretation of duplex eligibility in the RS10 zone district. The applicant is seeking to demolish the existing non-conforming duplex and while maintaining the use of the parcel as a duplex, refer to the board under section 1740-650 and 1741-80 item A. Um, the only opposition, are there any other parties um, wish to speak on case 160? Okay. Is uh, there any opposition? Uh, other than myself, sir, no. Uh, okay. All right. The, the uh, and I say that sort of a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, the, the prior case, I'm just waiting for the letters from the National Hackberry Association uh, to come in. To our, uh, the urban forester agrees with you, sir. So, um, the uh, this this case, uh, turning to this case now. This case is an item A appeal. Um, this type of case, a little bit backwards on the um, sequence of events. I'll actually go first, kind of explain history of the codes department, why why I denied the application, and then I'll turn it over to the appellant and her counsel um, to present their case. I will not get a rebuttal. Um, I am open to questions if you have them at any time, but I'll try to cover my case in chief in my ten minutes. So. I uh, don't think I need a full 10, but let me uh, let me go through the slides first. And then the uh, subject property, again, at 946 Battlefield Drive, located in um, south of downtown here. It's uh, subject property is located, this red parcel is the subject property. Um, and the uh, adjoining parcel is actually zoned in R10 zone. Um, I think Councilman Shulman rezoned this area back uh, there was a wave of, of rezonings from R to RS in parts of our county. Uh, I think this was one of them, and I believe two parcels were exempted from this particular rezoning, the one at the corner and the one adjoining the, the neighbor's property. Um, and let's look at the subject property here. This is the structure and property in question. And view from the street and view of um, subject property and adjoining properties. 
and then uh, I think this was submitted by the applicants for future plans, but kind of before we get there, the um, a lot of times in the, and I'm gonna flip back to the zoning code uh, for this. Okay, so a lot of these um, RS20 zones, RS zones and R districts that were rezoned in this mass rezoning, we get constantly asked in our department. It's probably in order of 40 to 50% of our day, um, our request from developers and, and property owners, can I build this a duplex? So one of the things we looked at, uh, in this particular case, this structure was built as a duplex. I don't dispute that at all. Um, our permit records indicate that uh, from the point at, at its original construction, up until the rezoning, uh, which occurred, let me get you the, the exact date of the rezoning because it is. Is germane to what we were talking about here today. I'm just briefly going to. Members, I apologize. This computer terminal over here believes I have two screens, but I indeed only have one. Um, so I'm going to do my best to attempt to get it on the screen here. Forget my cursor because that is my monitor up there on the on the big wall. Um, property was rezoned to RS10 in 2007. So what we look at on these structures when folks approach us to, to um, tear down and rebuild, we go back to the time in which the property uh, was zoned from R to RS. Now RS zone only permits a single family residence um, in this case. So what we ask of the appellants at that time is to provide us with uh, NES records of the subject property showing uh, the meter, showing that the service was on. Sometimes the service, and I'd say more often times, the service is uh, in separate uh, names, the tenant's names. Paul. Change location. So many times it's in the tenant's name. Uh, this particular case, I believe it was in the landowner's names. Both A and B were in the landowner's name. So usually what we asked at that point would be, uh, rental records of that to show that activity occurs. And I, I read the, I read the uh, uh, opposing counsel's brief, and I don't, I, I don't make any distinction. I disagree with his, with his outcome, obviously. But what's before us is not the fact that there's a dwelling unit out here. This is a non-conforming use case. The use that's non-conforming is the duplex use, the two-family use. Um, the, um, the appellant uh, who came to see me, uh, this nice lady, came to visit me and we talked through that. And she was honest enough, I'll, I'll admit this publicly, I don't always get honest answers uh, in the zoning office. And I know that may be shocking. Uh, but she was honest with me and, and told me that, no, the second unit was not used as dwelling unit, but it was rented out for an office use for a nonprofit. Uh, and, and, but did not have a tenant in that space. Uh, for a period of time, and from the standpoint of what I look at is the use of the property as a dwell as a second dwelling. It's a residential use. So my determination in this case is that she doesn't vest in grandfathering or continuing the use of the property because the use she had in there was an illegal use. An office use is not permitted in the R10 district or RS10 district. So she doesn't vest in the continuation or the operation within the walls of that space. Uh, because the um, the use that is non-conforming is the residential use. And let me read just briefly from... I always hated doing PowerPoints or going to PowerPoints where people just read it off the screen, but bear with me. So well, this, was a, this case deals with the inactivity of a non-conforming use. So... When a non-conforming use has been inactive for a period of 30 continuous months, 
the land and its associated improvements, the building itself, shall thereafter only be used in accordance with the provisions of, the zone, of this title, the zoning code, and intent to resume activity shall not qualify uh, for, the, for the continuation of the non-conforming use. And it spells out two instances in which that 30 months stops. They're not really at, at issue here today. Uh, the bottom one first was the 2010 flood. Uh, we, the council put in the non-conforming with the 2010 flood. That uh, provision two is actually sunsetted. Uh, there was only a five-year a, a five period in which we protected non-conforming uses. So if somebody's uh, duplex and RS got flooded out, they had five years to reestablish. Uh, number one is not an issue here because there's not litigation that disputes the use of the property that somehow told the 30 months provision. But the key parts I want you to understand are the use of the property as a two-family dwelling in a single-family use is the non-conforming use at issue here. And the second one is uh, the intent to use it. Hey, I meant to rent it out or, uh, you know, grandma died or whatever. That's not her case. But you've seen those. It's irrelevant. Uh, this is not a use that state law protects where the intent of the owner is paramount. Uh, Non-conforming uses of commercial property or commercial uses in a residential district, the burden's on the government to prove the owner intended to abandon the property and made some affirmative act uh, in furtherance of that intent. So that's to say here, in this particular case, the non-conforming use is a duplex, two dwelling units on a single structure. Her use of the left side or right side for some use other than residence is irrelevant to me. One, it's the illegal use, so you don't vest in an illegal use. And two, because no one lived there in a permanent structure, she's lost her nonconformity. So that's the my case in chief. So here if you have any questions. Um, But I would like to say publicly, I appreciate her honesty and candor with me that day. I don't always get that, so thank you for that. Um, we sometimes have to dig for that, um, and she was very honest and open with me. But unfortunately, that's how I had to come down on this case. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Hargis before we move to the app? Well, I'm, I had trouble reading that. Yeah. But um, so if the office was used... Does it matter what length of time it was used as an office? No, not not from not from my perspective because the the office use one is not allowed in that zone district. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, the office use to, in my mind is the same as if they didn't rent it at all, uh, because the use that they did use there is not permitted in that zone district. To to allow that, and the reason I can't count it, two po twofold purpose. One, I think, is public policy. We don't want to encourage illegal uses of property mm -hmm. to extend non-conforming uses. Uh, and two, we just we generally try not to allow uses that aren't allowed in the zone district. Um, okay. So, bottom line, your argument is because there was a non-conforming, or there was a period of a non-conforming, the non-conforming use was inactive for 30, 30 months. It wasn't used as residential for thirty months. Correct. Thereafter, it loses its being grandfathered in status, and then it has to comply with the the RS zone. It does. It does. And, and, and I think the code in the first section, uh, it even states that an intent to resume activity doesn't matter. I mean, is it, is the flat use it or lose it uh, mentality? In this case, the use, when I say use it, you have to use it as a residential use, both sides. And, and the non-conforming use that had to, that went inactive for 30 months was there was no, it was not being used as a dwelling. Correct. 30 months. Even though it was being used, the non-conforming use was not continuing. Correct. That's 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 where we came came down in this case. And I guess they might argue that even using it as a uh, for business operations or for not was that was still a nonconforming use. It was I mean, they not. They using it in. in let me distinguish that because I don't yeah. know what, what Mr. Poole is going to say. Right. To me, that is not a non-conforming use. Let me back up a little bit. Okay. If the original use, let's say it was zoned, it was zoned R R10, it had two dwelling units in there. But let's just say it had a dwelling unit and an office in it. Okay. And then Councilman Schulman then rezoned it to RS10. It was a. It would have been a non-conforming use from the get-go. But just for purposes of this illustration, it's rezoned. We look at the uses. Neither use, you know. The office wouldn't be allowed. She would be protected under 137208 of the state code because that's a business use in a residential zone. So different standard uh, in that. Um, I'd have
have to prove an intent to abandon. I'd have to prove that she made some affirmative act to abandon the office use. But to us, the office use was never legally there to begin with. So you don't vest in an illegal use of a property. It was being utilized, but it was being utilized illegally uh, from our standpoint. Ben, you're distinguishing between non-conforming and illegal. Because yes. I guess what I'm starting I'm in this case. It's being used. It's still a non. It seems to me like there's still an argument that it's a non-conforming use because it's not being used as residential. That's. But you're saying you interpret that as it's being used illegally. Correct. And and that still the non-conforming use was inactive while it was being used illegally. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Poole and, and the applicants. Uh, again, you guys will have 10 minutes to present your case. Uh, uh, quickly, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> is, there a, is there a vested rights issue with respect to the fact that the prior, the availability of the legally nonconforming use um, that would preempt the applicability of this code? I'm not aware of any, I mean, they vest in the right, let me put it this way, they vest in the right to use this structure as two dwelling units in a, in a single family zone. Yep. And to the extent I'm saying is that they stopped doing that and they did so for a period more than two and a half years. Um, they've lost that use. Now, I, I'll defer to legal counsel as far as vested rights act. I don't, I don't know that. that yeah, I mean, I, I think if it wasn't legal to begin with, it doesn't qualify even for TCA preemption so that's it's got to be a legally non-conforming use and in this case it wasn't ever legal so i don't think that would apply here but i'd be curious to hear what applicant would say good afternoon board uh kwan pool uh 511 union street uh i'll let my clients go ahead and introduce themselves my name is Melanie Pugh Weber, and I reside at 946 Battlefield Drive on the B side of the duplex. And I want to thank Mr. Hargis for affirming my character because I work with teenagers. And I had, I had no reason other than to be honest because I had no reason to understand that we were out of line in any way. So I'll start there. And I'm Jim Weber. I also live at 946B Battlefield Drive, and uh, we uh, don't even intend to threaten hackberries uh, on our property. Uh, and, and so I, I would take issue with, uh, and I'll, I guess we'll get there eventually, I, I would take issue that it, it was an illegal use uh, at the property. So uh, since the Webers purchased the property in 1996, uh, some almost 30 years ago, uh, and at all times from that point moving forward, uh, this property was used as a, as a two-family structure, as a duplex. Uh, they've got separate units, uh, separate entrances, separate utility meters. Um, even, you know, they'll describe even the attic space that's above the home has been divided. So if you were to go up into the attic, it's, it's not free-flowing. There's an A side and there's a B side even, even to the attic space. Um, you know, of course, I mean, I think Mr. Hargis has done a good job of, of going over the, the background of the case, but this was completely not an issue until 2007 when the then uh, council member down zoned a significant, significant portion of Green Hills and, and Battlefield Drive um, was included in that. However, uh, because they had been operating that structure since 1996 as a duplex structure uh, under 1714-650-E2, uh, they're allowed to uh, demolish and, and restore that structure, which is uh, what they intend to do. Um, that they intend to build two structures, and quite frankly, because of the cost of real estate in Asheville, um, really the only way for them to be able to afford to, to continue to live in this neighborhood is to sell one of the properties and then use the proceeds to pay their own mortgage. Um, they, they've occupied this structure for all these years as their primary residence, um, and at no point did they abandon that two-family use. Well, They're, but, yeah, but it, they did for a while... The, at least 30, min 30 months, they they used it, but they didn't use it as a family dwelling. Is that, are we in agreement on that? 
I would say that I don't think the use has been inactive. Maybe that's a, a, a better and, and way. And I'm to, with way you on that. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to figure out. Do we sure. do we agree that if for for at least 30 months there was a, a use that was not residential that was renting to the nonprofit? So so. I think she'll testify more specifically to that, but I think it's it's twofold. One, even if this property had been rented to uh, a nonprofit, I, I think it was, I, I don't know that my client fully understood what Mr. Hargis was asking. This was a, a tenant of hers. All of the day-to-day, the, -day, the comings and goings of that tenant, she didn't know, quite frankly. But even if it was rented to uh, a, a nonprofit, the zoning code allows that home occupation use, right? And that home occupation use is allowed as a accessory to residential use. So to have, and, and she'll testify, you'll hear that she uh, is an employee of that nonprofit. And so occupying that A unit of that structure by the nonprofit um, would qualify as a home occupation. And so because a home occupation use is an accessory to a residential use, it's still being used um, as, a residence, as, as a residential uh, property. And so your, your position would be it was not an illegal use? That's correct. Correct. But would your position be that it was a, a conforming use? Because then if it's a conforming use, I, I guess my question would be, well, did didn't therefore the non-conforming use stop for at least 30 months. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tricky one. I think I'm trying to, but your position is it's not an illegal use, right? I, our position is that is because the, the the act of, or I guess I guess I should distinguish it. It was not being operated as an office for a commercial purpose. Right, and so renting out that second unit to a nonprofit that for which she also worked qualifies as a home occupation. So that B, or excuse me, the A unit was not being used uh, for commercial purposes. It was being used for a residential purpose, right? And so you've got a family occupying one side of the structure for residential purpose. You've got a, a, a home occupation used in the other side of the structure, which is also residential. Okay, I'll follow you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. So, Mr. Poole, sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Would, would you agree that... If this, if the if the A unit had been um, uh, vacant, but advertised for lease for a period of thirty months, that technically under the code as written, it would be, uh, or it, and under the code as the zoning administrators applied it, that would be deemed effectively um, inactive, right? Even if the party, I, and I'm I'm asking this as a, you know. As more of a, to get to your point about inactivity, um, is not defined, and so there's some sort of vagaries around that. But would you agree that effectively, you know, as as the zoning administrator is, is reading this provision, that if the place were vacant and if it were marketed through a realtor, that despite their best efforts to lease this space out to someone that they all of a sudden might be deemed to no longer have this use? I, I think that is, I think it's a tough question. Um, I, I think that if, if the owner, the property owner continues to maintain it as a, as a unit uh, and it's just not selling and they're continuing to pay a separate uh, utility meters, in, in my opinion, I would say that's, that's still active. Um, you know, I, I think of there are so many examples of residential structures throughout Davidson County that are in IR districts, IWD, or even CS zoning districts. And those properties sit vacant. But when someone moves into that property, when they seek to go make additions to them, we don't say you've got to tear down that single family home and only put in a commercial use. Um, you know, I was even thinking about the case that I was here for a couple months ago when I was before you guys, that, that project on Dickerson Pike. Those homes, even though they were residential homes, they were in CS zone districts, and, and no one forces them to tear those homes down, to tear those homes down and put a commercial property there, even, even when they're vacant. And so I think to apply that standard to someone uh, in a duplex, 
I, I think would be when, when there's no clear definition for inactivity. Um, I think that would be harsh, but but I understand your point. If no one's living there, well, and and, I, and actually, my, the other question I had too is is the this provision of the code requires a it speaks to an intent to resume activity. Um, does that it suggest that there has to be an intent to abandon the use? Uh, as a prerequisite if there's an intent to resume it? That, that, that's our opinion. And, and I think because of her actions and continuing to, and so, I mean, the, the reason, the lease that she had set up with, with, with that nonprofit was uh, just all inclusive. It was a pure rent amount. So that was the reason why their names were still on both A and B. Um, but when you look at the, the, the code's definition of a dwelling unit, uh, it's a single unit providing complete independent living facilities for one or more persons, including permanent provisions for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation. That's what a unit is under the, under the zoning code. And when you look at what's a, uh, a two-family unit, it's essentially two dwelling units. So when you look at how they've operated this property, regardless of, of what tenant was in that property, it has always been... Uh, a unit that is suited for one or more persons to live, sleep, eat, cook, or clean in that unit. They never changed that. They never tore down the wall. They never opened up the space to create one single unit. And so their intent uh, has always been to operate that um, that property as such. If, if the right... Um, sorry, I suddenly just got louder. I don't know if that was me or the universe. Um, if the right prospective residential tenant had come along uh, for the right amount of money, would your clients have leased the space out? I don't think they would, but I'll let them answer the Because I think that their operation of that space was, was tied almost their work in the community, but I'll let them answer. Thanks. Thank you all so much. We really do appreciate your time today. Um, because as we say, we work in a ministry that helps people. And we have a space that uh, was being paid for by a separate entity. We got rent every month. And this nonprofit was free to allow people respite stays whenever they needed there. They, you know, it was, it was about helping people. And there were a, pe a lot of people there. My husband, Jim Weber, and I. Oh. Explain what a respite stay is. Oh, if, if there's someone coming... Um, you know, we work with the, the teenagers we work with become young adults, and 18 to 24 year olds may not have their feet quite up under, legs up under them quite right. So, if, if people are just in between housing situations or there was some kind of family problem and someone needed to be, who could legally, who was of age, could legally be out of their home and they just needed a place to stay for a while, um, that's what we mean by respite. It wasn't. Um, so, there were people. So there were people you were you were being paid rent for it by a nonprofit, but Correct. You're, you're saying that there were people that were using it as a dwelling unit that would come there and stay overnight because they needed a place. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and it, there was never there was never a thirty month period where somebody didn't stay overnight. Um, um, I don't have a log of how many nights people were there, so I can't tell that's that, a, but I don't know that. like two and a half years. I mean, could you tell us that in two and a half, it continue, you never had a lapse of two and a half years from somebody staying overnight or? It was always available when people, you know, that people could stay there because it had all the elements and amenities of a dwelling that anyone would need. So, but I don't know. I don't have a record of how many nights um, people were there. Right. It, that's not the question of how many. It's did someone stay one night right. and then For three 30 years. months go by and someone stay again Not without three. someone else staying in that 30-month period? Oh, well, there were definitely people there within those time frames, yes. Okay. So there was never a 30-month stretch where you could say during this 30-month stretch, nobody slept overnight in the unit. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you had Can I break protocol just for a minute? Because this is, this is key to this. <clears throat> if... And, I, and I'd ask if we could possibly even defer this case. If if the appellants had someone sleeping there for even a night, right, thirty straight months, she's vested. 
uh, and, and the use is still continuing. So I, I'd ask if we could put a deferral and give them time to collect records. I know that she and I, did, we didn't get to that specificity. Um, but that's, that's paramount to me because if she had one of these young adults staying on the premises, that clock, that clock resets. Um, that 30 months provision starts over. Yeah. Uh, you got a, you got an eyeball back indicating he wants a deferral. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I got an eyeball back. <laughs> okay. That he didn't mind the deferral. Right. Put it off the chain. Okay. I'll. I'll uh, <laughs> Is there a second on that? Mr. Gold, I see you second. I, I did second. Do we have a date? Do you, yeah. The 5th? The 5th or the 19th? How long is it going to take to get the records? Well, it's going to take a while. I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, are, we, are, we discussing, yes. okay. are we discussing the motion? The 19th? I, yeah, we're discussing the motion. Whether I mean, my, I, my comments in the discussion of the motion are that we have testimony in the record that there were people that were staying there in that period. I mean, I... I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not presuming to speak for everybody, but I'm comfortable moving forward on this today, based upon based upon the testimony and the statements. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get over. It's it's an illegal conduct going on. In, in well, Congress. and Mr. Well, it's not. That's the te the at least the testimony is that it's not. But also, if it gives Mr. Hargis the opportunity to. to reverse his decision so that this is no longer an item of territory. We might be that, in a, that's what we should do. you know. And, and I would add, I think it's a, this is a, this yeah. is How much not a, this there. is one of the complicated, <laughs> putting these code provisions together. So, I mean, I, and I, I accept your client's testimony. I just think that it, for the reason of us understanding it better, and if there is information available that will allow us to objectively verify further that there were there was not a 30 month lapse i think that would be beneficial okay mr chair if i could make just okay. one small point <laughs> to uh, reconsider to yeah to, to mr bradford's point I, I our office would not buy the home occupation argument at all but to the extent of oh yeah there's you know I, i'd like to have some documentation put it and that way i'll dismiss the case uh, I'll, I'll withdraw my statement and and they, these folks can proceed and it's not even in front of you guys so what do you think Pastor Bradford? does that help mm -hmm. I, i'm i'm you know i'm 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 sympathetic and i i want mr hargis's office to operate in the way that it it needs to operate so i'm i'm good with the deferral okay. so a motion's been seconded i think okay all in favor of the motion to defer yes any opposed? Okay, that passes. We'll defer that. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for your service. Watching Channel 3 is one of my favorite. I watch, I watch Channel 3. I watch these hearings like my grandmama watched her soap opera. So thank you all for your Maybe you're not the only one. I know. And, right. and one of these days, I'll just bring you a simple two-foot variance request. <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> well, uh, Thank you for your, your your very well put together letter and for Mr. Harris's testament presentation too. It was it, you made a complicated issue. Both of you made it easier to understand. So Okay, uh, next case. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the uh, next case for the board will be case 2022-161, uh, Allison Clarity, uh, the appellant owner of the property, uh, the Clarity Family of Revocable Living Trust is the owner of the property, um, located at 723 Hill Road, requesting a variance in the allowable size and allowable living quarter square footage in the R40 district. The appellant is seeking to convert the existing accessory structure to a DADU. Refer to the board under section 17-16030-G7, letters A and C. The appellant has alleged jurisdiction under 17-4180. Item B, is the applicant present? Yes. Oh, there you are, miss. Uh, give me one second, we'll go through the case. And um, um, I think this is kind of a case of first impression for the board, so I'll kind of go over the DADU requirements, too, uh, for you. And the subject property is located on the south margin of Hill Road. Uh, it is the red property shown here. This is the uh, aerial photo of the site. The 
uh, structure, I believe, in question is this um, building located at the rear by the pool here? And the view into the subject property, view from the street and then adjoining properties. Um, some inside views of the structure and floor plan. Okay, so to kind of go over the code uh, for you. Are your um, screens working in front of you? If they're not, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's why I stuck that up on the screen. Um, here, let me read to you just briefly. Um, the Dadu section uh, in Davidson County has twofold. We have we have the the general section in the zoning code that lays out specific things that you're allowed to do and not do. That's in 1716030G. Uh, the Dadu provisions also in the definition have additional requirements, which this property does meet. Uh, so now we're talking about the specific restrictions on Dadus, and the two that they are appealing is the living space provisions are limited to 700 square feet in it, uh, so that's 700 square feet of living area in it, and on lots greater than 10,000 square feet, as the applicant's lot is, I believe, right at an acre or slightly over. Uh, the footprint of the detached accessory dwelling shall not exceed a thousand feet. Now, this is a little bit in contrast in her situation. She's taking an existing accessory building and converting it to a dadu. Uh, accessory buildings on her lot can be uh, of unlimited size. Well, there's a limit to size, but it's ultimately it deals with the lot area of the thing. Um, and then, obviously, accessory buildings don't have living space uh, dwelling quarters in them. Um, so her appeal is twofold uh, in this would be the 700 square feet of living area and the size of the structure which the council placed upon Dadu's. And I'll just leave it on the aerial photo is probably the best uh, one that. But that's the case records we have. It. Are there any parties present opposed to the case? Okay, Mr. Chairman, seeing none, Miss, you'll have uh, five minutes to present your testimony. Uh, so we bought the property Ma five years ago. Could you start by telling us your name oh, and address I, for the record? Thank yes, you. my name is Allison Clority, and I live at 725 Hill Road. So we bought the property five years ago specifically because of the detached structure, not realizing that we weren't allowed to sleep in it. Um, so we've been using it, now I know illegally, for the last five years as a guest house for parents and caretakers and nannies. Um, my son has a disability, so we have a lot of people coming and staying. And um, recently learned that that is not allowed. It's 1,211 square feet, so it's a little bit 211 square feet over the allotted 1,000. Um, we don't want to change anything about it. We just want to be staying in it legally. Um, we have the support of the direct neighbors. They've written a letter in support um, to just change the permitting on it. Our, the previous owners who built it permitted it for a pool house and I believe used it as a home office. Um, we don't have a guest room in our actual home because we have a home office there that we use the um, available bedroom for. And so we simply just want to keep it as is with the bedroom. It has a bathroom and it has a kitchenette. Um, it doesn't have laundry or facilities to cook with, but it's the perfect space for short-term guests. And so simply we just want to change the permitting on it so that we can keep the bed in there and use it legally. You don't rent it out, do you? We do not. Okay. And so uh, our zoning administrator will correct me if I'm wrong about this, but we can't, we, we can't approve a certain use or not. What we can approve is you've got 211 square feet that is you shouldn't have, and we can give you a variance on that. Right. But we can't say, and it's okay to use it this way right. or that way. That's a whole different That's another difference. application, so, yes. Yeah, and so. so I would just say the hardship would be to remove 211 square feet would cause my neighbor's disruption, whereas just keeping it as is with the 200 extra square feet that's there would not cause anyone any harm. And it was built before you bought it? It was built before we bought it and permitted um, before we bought it as a pool house. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. Anyone? I, I thought this was going to be one of our consent agenda cases, but, you know. Well, is it, 
<laughs> is, that, is that little thing at the end of it? Sorry, I'm calling your, okay. of your house, but is that part of the... That's a sunroom. That's part of our actual No, house. I'm talking about down at the bottom. Oh, it's a shed, really. Okay, but that's not oh, included no. in the amount of space that's too much? I don't understand it to be. I think that's a. De is that a detached? It's yet? detached. Right. From the yeah. Okay. So it is. Right. <clears throat> I couldn't tell if it was stuck on it or not. And that was the offending. Oh. <laughs> if it were, I'd get rid of it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I ask just a quick question? I, I think the applicant testified. Were you, did I understand you're not intending the short term rent the structure? We have considered it. My husband at this time is against that. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but right now it's for family. No, I understand. I, I thought yep. I heard you say that. I, I was making notes for the case record. Okay. I just want to be clear. Sure. I have a zoning question when you start. Okay. If it became a dadu, then they could rent it as a short-term rental property? Would that be allowed? Yeah, dadus are permitted uh, for short-term rental. I, I just misunderstood her. I, I thought uh -huh. I didn't in any way, wasn't really going down that road. But yes, dadus are permitted. Accessory structures are permitted for short-term rental. And uh, if we were to improve this, could we put a restriction on, we can't put a restriction on the use? I think you could if it's a... I mean, I, Alex and I were talking. I, I don't know that the use of the structure is necessarily germane to the case. Uh, Dadus are full houses, so you know, further restricting the use of that house, we we kind of think that may be out of bounds for you guys. Um, it, it would allow whatever a house would would permit in that. But it's in a. Our zone district, so two structures are allowed on that property, right? Correct. Duplexes are, are permitted um, in in that situation. Um, is, and since we're, everybody watches this on Channel 3, I want to make sure the development community understands that just because you have our, our zoning, and let's say in this case it's R40 and your lot has 40,000 square feet, does not mean you get a duplex as a matter of right. I uh, can't tell you how often I get that, but um, there are certain conditions. Was the lot created prior to 1984? Or was it a subdivision of a lot? I haven't looked at those, and, and her request, to be honest with you, was not to build a true second dwelling. Uh, this DADU provision is one that the council's allowed with the size and bulk of a of an accessory structure but the rights of a full house it, it, it's a little bit new and that's why i say it's kind of a case of first impression you, i don't think you all have seen a case over the square footage of a dadu but the thing to remember with the dadus is it has the setbacks of an accessory structure which might be less than a normal house would be but it has the full rights of a house um, the only thing that she cannot do in a dadu that a duplex would allow would be the sell condo HPR or sell that property. It has to be owned by the same owner. The owner has to be on the premises, uh, that sort of thing. So it does have some use restrictions tied to it. But this particular her case is about the square footage. What was the what was the square footage of this lot? Uh, the lot itself, it's over an acre. Uh, it's like one point. Um, I recall looking. Let's see. Sorry, I'll punch it up real quick. So an observation is we have pretty consistently as a board in the past where somebody has bought a property that has something that's non-conforming, um, found that to be under our the special, like, special circumstances. And um, I mean, my observation is it's a 211, it's about a 20% variance. Um, and I suppose that if we didn't approve it, that they'd have to demolish it and rebuild it and or take out 211 square feet, as I understand it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, also just thinking about the ten, it's a it's a thousand square feet for ten thousand or greater, and we're talking about a forty thousand ish square foot lot. Something. It's a it's one and a third, one point three seven acres. So more than forty thousand square foot lot. And we're telling you, it's a 200-square-foot it's difference, right. you know. So, uh, you know, to me, based upon the size of the lot itself, um, I, I think that that's a, that's, that 
that is reason for me to think that this increase, you know, that the variance would be appropriate. In addition to kind of what you what you had mentioned. I mean, how did this get to us? We're talking about demolishing it. Were there like complaints or something? Like, this just seems kind of random to me. But. That's a great question. I don't know. How, I don't know how. I don't know how it got here. I mean, it's. They didn't code I think maybe the applicant, maybe, and that's why I wanted to make clear, we don't, we don't have anything to do with the use. So I think maybe the applicant thought that if we had something to do with the use, uh, to why don't we? Can we? Does anybody object to opening up the public hearing? And let's. So, ma'am, that's what, where wow. it came into play. I, I, my husband and I were considering renting it out, and so we inquired with the, um, I forgot what the codes, or, the codes, okay. board, whatever. And he said, "Well, you have a pool house, so that would never happen anyway." And I said, "Well, what does that mean?" And they said, "Well, you can't uh, sleep in it." And I said, "Does that mean we can't have anyone to sleep in it?" And they said, "Yes, you need to talk to." the zoning board about changing it, changing the permitting on it. Right, okay. So that's where I, I thought, like people buy houses with pool houses all the time and they don't expect to be able to rent out a pool house because it's a pool house. It's a, its use is to adjacent to the pool. So for me, I'm having a hard time with a 20% variance without a hardship. I'm being honest, like yeah. it's a pool house. If you use it as a pool house, then this isn't before us which seems like how it was intended when they bought it and they had full... Well, when we, I'm sorry, when we bought it, the previous owner was using it as an office and they had, there's a separate door where they had um, like a fold out sofa. They had a kitchenette and a bathroom. So I, it was not marketed to us as a pool house. I've never used it as a pool house. It wasn't being used as a pool house then. Um, so I didn't even know it was considered, it is next to our pool, yes, but I didn't know it was considered a pool house until six months ago. Right. You said it had the kitchenette when you bought it. It has the kitchenette. Everything was as it is when we bought it, except of course our furniture is in there now, but so unless nothing's changed. Questions, do we need to because we, we didn't really open back the public here. Yeah, we so. didn't. You know, Sorry. You know, okay. Did you guys didn't build the pool, right? It was an existing when it was there. Okay. Well, and so, Miss Davis, what I point out is, regardless of what we do, there are recorded restrictions. When they got this built, even though it's 200 square feet too much, there is there is a restrictive covenant for a detached structure that runs with the land that says this structure shall not be used as living quarters for commercial activity or in any incongruous use. So I don't, I think in my mind, what may have happened here is I don't think we, I don't know how they get around the restrictive covenant ever. So I think that probably the misconception here was if we go get an approval, if we get a variance because we didn't have the right square footage, it's going to get rid of the restrictive covenants and if I could address that just briefly. Sure, yeah. I, we, our office, when we've had conversions, so in years past, we, and we still do it now, accessory buildings, we put that covenant on every one of them. Can't live in it, can't sleep in it, can't There's use it. There's one on this property. Right? There is on this property. In instances where we've had folks convert buildings, let's say that were the correct size to a DADU, uh, we would sign a release of the first restrictive covenant and require a recording of a second covenant for the DADU restrictions. Okay, but we could, we... You wouldn't, I mean, if we approved them just having the 120 extra square feet, that wouldn't trigger necessarily y'all removing these covenants, right? Yes, we and would, because would her that? request is to convert this to a DADU. So we would take, we would, we would require them to release the covenants, give us a release, we'd sign, and then record a new covenant saying it's being used as a DADU and not a full house. But, but that, that's if you convert it to a DADU, which is not what we're here about, right? <laughs> Is she, her intent is to convert this to a daddy. Yes, sir. That's why we're here. Our van, if we grant this variance, it converts this pool house to a daddy. Now, it's not from the, okay, from the well, sense. Okay, well, I missed that part. That went <laughs> right over me, so. Uh, that was my question of the applicant about STR short-term rental permits, which are separate from this board now, thank goodness. Uh, but. <laughs> But is that, I thought I misunderstood her to say, no, we don't have an intention of short-term renting it. I just want to get that clarity, because I actually support that board too, so I was trying to wing both my hands. So, and, and that went right over my head, and I tried to study this, but so you're, what, what is the mechanism by which 
if we approve the extra 120 square feet, it, we authorize the dad do. That's what I'm. That's what I'm not catching. That, that's what Joey just said. So essentially, if we give this variance that allows this extra fee then it converts this existing structure to a DADU and the restrictive covenant codes would release it. And then it's a DADU with all the full rights of a DADU that that statute intended. And everybody else in the neighborhood upset because they've got a DADU. Okay. Well, okay, that's... So that's why I was glad it wasn't on consent because I thought that this was... I, I didn't understand the hardship, so... And let me, let me talk as far as... Chairman and I obviously talk about consent agenda items. Oh, Th this is not a use per not a use variance, which this board cannot do use variances. It's not a use variance in the sense of um, it is the use is allowed in that zone district. So no issues with that. It is too big under this the statute, you know, the square footage and the, the living space. So she could ask for a variance in that. We did have an applicant once file an appeal because they didn't meet any of the technical requirements of being on a lot with an alley or being in a historic district. No, you can't appeal that. But you can certainly appeal the square footage restrictions under the under this section, which is what her appeal uh, is about. Um, so I want to preface that it's, it's not allowing a use. Dadus are allowed here. If she met the requirements, right. correct. Right. Yeah, I just right. I, I didn't want to leave that lingering as though we're granting any type of use variance. Um, yeah, because if she if if she chopped 211 square feet off this building, yeah. we wouldn't be here because she'd be in compliance with. She can't have the data because she's not in compliance with the code. That's that's the part I missed. Okay. The plot thickens. Okay, I thought I have arms around this one, and thank you, Ms. Davis, for catching me on that one. So, uh, you, Joey, would you show us a picture again of the of the dwellings or the buildings? Sure, Ms. Loss, if you don't mind. Uh, Channel 3 folks wanted me to just send me a note. Be sure to turn your uh, mic on there. Uh, let me see. There we go. If there's one in particular you want me to stop at. No, that's okay. It seems to me like that if we approve it, then it can become a dad do. If we don't approve it, then I don't necessarily think it means that the applicant has to remove 211 square feet of the house. Is that, am I, am I, or, or Ms. Davis and I thinking about that correctly? Is that, it means, it means not only that it means she couldn't rent it, but it also means she could, people can't sleep in it. So it, it would basically, what we would be doing is, is, effectively saying bring your guest room inside your house and move your office outside or something along those lines but that you know the, the you can't legally sleep in there so it couldn't be uh, an in-law an in-law suite or something of the, of the like which that's really more what we're talking about you know I mean? yeah. and it was it was built out originally when they bought it with these kitchenette and all that so that that seems kind of unfair to them that I mean I get not expanding the use to a dadu but leaving them in a position where they come before us and they bought something that had a pre-existing use and now they don't have it so i'll make a motion that we approve the variance as requested um, based upon the hardship demonstrated uh, related to the shape of the lot and the pre-existing use, um, the unique characteristics of the property, uh, that the hardship was not self-imposed, uh, financial gain was not the only basis, and there's no entry to the neighboring property or public welfare. I'll second that. Any discussion on that? 
Okay, all in favor say aye. I gotta go this time. Is that an aye? It's an aye. Okay, so they're Very all opposed. Two opposed, so that passes four to two. Okay, next case. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think we need to say that there's no pre uh, <clears throat> That is not going to set our standard going forward and looking at something like this. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, next case, case 2000, or penultimate case, case 2022-162. Oh, uh, I'm oh. sorry, can we take a five-minute break before right. we start the next? We have two left, correct? Yes, sir, that's okay, correct. Okay, we can take a five-minute okay. break, so... Next case is 2022-162. Mark Insana is the appellant and owner of the property located at 5308 Overton Road, requesting a variance from rear and side setback requirements in RS-20. Uh, the appellant is seeking to construct a new garage. Refer to the board under section 1720030. Appellant has alleged jurisdiction under section 1740-180. Item B is the appellant present. All right, come on forward, sir. We'll. Uh, I'll go through the case record first, and then I'll turn it over to you to identify yourself and, and make your appeal. All right, Mr. Chairman, this um, subject property is located on the east margin of Overton Road. Uh, that is the property colored in red there. Uh, aerial photograph of the subject property. It's located here. The uh, view from the street and adjoining properties. A view along the side property line, and uh, this is the approximate location of the proposed structure here. And view of the backyard, and this is the uh, site plan submitted by the applicant. Uh, his request is to um, is to construct that building. The um, the setbacks in RS40 are uh, typically a I'm sorry R20, uh, 10 foot side yard and 20 foot rear. <coughs> I'll leave this slide up here. And with that, sir, I'll turn it over to you to identify yourself and give us your address and make a presentation to the board. Uh, my name is Mark Insana. I live at 5308 Overton Road. Um, my family and I have lived there for 10 years now. Uh, we're proposing uh, this garage slash uh, workshop. Uh, the hardship um, comes in a few forms. Um, as you can see, the trees are all uh, plotted up there on the uh, side plan. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to um, put this building in, in in a manner that doesn't that disrupts the, all the adjoining trees in the least amount possible. Well, let me um, ask you about that before we move sure. on. Thing. Can you put the block drawing back up with it? Because it looked it looked to me like. Uh, I could be wrong, but it looked like it, it might, and I'm not a arborist, but it looks like it might affect that one tree. And I'm looking at the picture, it's a hackberry color that looks like it's just one tree. And it looks like it's a, <laughs> what's that? I said it's a hackberry. Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, we've lived there for 10 years. There's a lot of trees in that area and on that property, and we've we have uh, we we've tried to live with those trees the best that we can because you know they've been uh, you know through storms and stuff. We've had some fall. Um, we have had some taken down, um, but we are trying to you know retain you know the the area that you know because like I said, it's it's a heavily you know uh, there's there's a lot of trees in that area. Um, the other the other reason um, is uh, as you can see the the driveway the way the driveway lines up um, in moving the uh, the building back in, in the manner that we're we're asking it, it, it helps uh, keep the driveway lined up and uh, it also helps retain uh, the backyard uh, a bit more um, so 
as an overall plan, it just seems like it makes more sense to, you know, be able to move it back. And in the process, uh, I've spoke to uh, particularly the two neighbors, adjoining neighbors, uh, very specifically about the project. Um, they've both, both verbally signed off and the neighbor uh, directly to the right, um, who was most affected, um, they were nice enough to drop a letter uh, and submitted a letter uh, stating their uh, that they were okay with what we were doing. Do you have a copy of it? It was submitted. Is it is it part of? I mean, I, I have the letter. If you want me to read it, would that be better? Uh, if you could just hand it, and we'll and Pat will pass it around and take okay. a look at it because I, I don't know that it was in our package. Okay. And, th and this is a letter from who? The, the neighbors directly to the right of me, if you're looking okay. at the front of the house, directly to the right. So, so like I said, the, the, the largest impact is to them. Because of the side setback. Right. Yeah, okay. So the people that live behind me live on uh, a property just shy of two acres. Um, and uh, they've got trees and brush. Um, we're still staying, or we're asking to stay 10 feet from the, the rear setback. So um, between the distance from their house, the trees, uh, the additional 10 feet, uh, uh, they're, they're minimally uh, affected by this. And like I said, I've actually spoke to them and, and got verbal approval from them as well. Okay, uh, any questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you, sir. We'll close the public hearing and discuss. Thank you. You might want to stay right there in case we open the public hearing back up and ask have questions. Sure. That, that happens, okay. as you've probably seen from some of our other hearings. Well, since this involves trees, I'm going to be quiet until Mr. Lawless well, that's just speaks, that's speaks his piece. Jumped in there and took that one off, uh, from you from from past experience. Um, the hackberry tree that, and I'm assuming that's the one that's right next. That's right. Okay, how big is it? Oh, it's uh, 12 inch diameter. Okay, it's, it's actually the smaller of all the trees. So, so if if there was a a condition that you put real trees in there to replace it somewhere else in that area that would be okay I guess I should I should stop the smirching I don't like them either <laughs> any any further thoughts um the presence and the number of the trees and the efforts to avoid that. I mean, to me, the, the existence of the trees is a hardship in terms of the current characteristics of the property. Um, and it appears that they've made their best effort to cite this without removing any of those. Yeah. As long as we have some replacement types of, of trees for the ones the, the, that are removed. And I think there's organizations here that'll sometimes bring them bring them to you for cheap or free sometimes. Yep, too. exactly. The permit processing actually even Sir, it, it as well. it just we've the closed the public hearing. Oh. I appreciate that. I, I don't mean to be rude, but we have okay. we do close a public hearing. So, so um, is so that a motion or? I already made I already made a motion today. Somebody else. I mean, I can make another one. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> sure. We can. Uh, yeah, uh, I will uh, make a motion that um, we approve the variance based upon the applicant's demonstration uh, of the uh, standards required by section 17.40.370 uh, um, that the characteristics of the property having mature trees uh, is a unique and exceptional hardship uh, warranting uh, a variance and setback uh, and that the hardship is not self-imposed, financial gain is not the basis, and there's no injury to neighboring property or public welfare. Okay. Sir. On the condition, with the added condition that uh, for, for each tree removed, uh, a tree is planted in its place. 
I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll vote. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye, aye. All opposed? Okay, that passes. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> I should have uh, I should have had you come and take down the one in my yard that was dead for free rather than having to pay somebody to do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll need to hang on to that. Chairman, our uh, last case for today is case 2022-165, uh, 6661 Riverview Drive. Uh, this property is located along the Cumberland River uh, in West Nashville, near the terminus of Riverview Drive. The um, aerial photograph of the property, this is just a bit north of, um, I'm blanking on the dock that's south of here. Mr. Cuthbertson, do you recall? I, I don't recall. I've spent an afternoon out there and I've forgotten all about it. All right. Um, this is a view of the subject property. Looking at the subject property. Properties to either side. If I understand correctly, the request is to take down this residence and construct a new one. Um, and they are requesting a variance in street setback. Uh, the contextual street setback average is 70 feet. We are proposing 41. I believe that is. Just double check that. 41.2. And that is the case records. We have it, sir. If you identify yourself, make your presentation. Mr. Chairman, for the record, there is no one else in the room but us. Uh, so we'll have five minutes remaining. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 409 Merritt Avenue. I'm here on behalf of the owner of 6661 Riverview Drive. And uh, as Mr. Hargis explained, we're requesting a variance of the street setback so that we can, the owner can build back a new home on this property. Um, we're going back to the theme that you all discussed earlier, stream buffers. And uh, as he pointed out, this property is right up against the Cumberland River. That's the ultimate stream in Davidson County. And about 10 years ago or so, Metro Stormwater enacted uh, the, the, the um, stream buffers. And up against waterways such as the Cumberland, that stream buffer is 75 feet. And that's not from the actual water, that's from the floodway. So the floodway on this site is about a quarter of the way into the property. And so that 75 foot buffer is measured off of that floodway. And so you'll see the line uh, identifying the floodway buffer on this site. And it's about two thirds of the way into the property. And so when you take into account the floodway buffer and then this 70 foot street setback, the owner is left with essentially nothing to build a reasonable house on, to, to rebuild a house on. And so we're asking for the variance uh, to allow a reasonable space within which to build a new home on. Uh, the request is for a street setback of 41 feet. Um, that's only slightly closer to the street than the existing house. The existing house today is 48 feet from the street. Uh, we feel like this request is, is, is a reasonable request. It would not disrupt the block pattern, if you will. This house is at the very end of the block, uh, right up against Metro Water property. Uh, and so it's not mid-block. It's not something that we're asking to come up in front of an established block pattern. Um, and, you know, it would look totally out of place. Uh, we're asking for the relief to, to build back a, a reasonably sized house, nothing monstrous. Um, this is part, this is the first step of a, what's essentially a two-step process. We have to, in order to build back here, they're going to have to ask for a variance of the zoning setback. And if they get this variance, then they actually have to go to the stormwater variance board and ask for relief um, to build 
into a portion of that buffer, but also keep some of the existing elements back there. You'll notice there's an existing pool and a pavilion and, and such behind this house. They'd like to keep those elements. Um, that's not subject to this board today, but uh, it's a crapshoot as to whether that stormwater variance board will actually allow them to do it. So we're really just trying to create reasonable space to build a house back on this property. Uh, step one is that zoning variance. Um, that stormwater buffer, that stormwater board is going to make us overcompensate for landscaping. So to the point of trees, uh, we are going to have to buffer our landscape, or sorry, enhance our landscaping in the back. Whatever trees are there, they're gonna have to remain and we're gonna have to add to them. Um, we would commit that uh, we will build or build, we'll plant f up to four new canopy trees in the front to help again compensate, but add to the um, uh, the character of the street. It would also mitigate some of the impact that uh, one might think they'd see with a reduced setback uh, along that street. So this neighbor's uh, put in a lot of work and talked to every single neighbor on this block. Uh, you should have a petition uh, circulating across your, your desk. Uh, every single neighbor has signed uh, in support of this variance request, but for one, and that one she did talk to and he verbally agreed to support it. She just couldn't get him. He's about 84. He couldn't couldn't get to his computer and sign on. The council member has also uh, expressed support for this variance. So with that, I'll rest and answer any questions you might have. Any questions before we close up here? Oh, I have one, I, I, maybe I wrote it down wrong. I thought I read a letter from the councilman opposing this. Now, I may have totally missed it. I've, I've already missed something big here earlier. I hope that's the case. I've not seen that letter. You you have an okay. email in front I, of you. I, may, I wrote down the councilman opposes. I may have gotten, maybe I'm thinking about the wrong case. But So you're saying the count, you're representing the councilman supports it? I'm representing the council member supports it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a support. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, maybe I was reading when I hadn't had enough coffee or something. Either that so, or the property owner right. is very convincing. And oh, thank you. Yes. Any further questions? I do have a question. Um, I think I'm looking at the right drawing. So the house next door to it has a 53-foot setback? Yes. And then you're asking for 41.2 feet, and that's to... My eyes are failing me right now. That's on the far side <laughs> from that house. You'll notice our house kind of steps back a little bit as we get closer to the neighbor's house as well. Okay, so it's 48.5 feet to the corner that's near the house that's 53 feet. Uh, I, I don't have that dimension. Okay. You, you could probably do the math using all the dimensions the on the site plan. Pack it here. <laughs> okay. Um, so where's the 41 foot? Is that to the... To a carport? To the garage, to the proposed garage. I want to make sure I well, If you're looking at the site plan, it's on the right side. You, you, uh, you might be looking at the existing conditions Maybe. site plan. <laughs> Maybe I'm looking at the wrong. Okay, I must be looking at the wrong. The existing house is 48.5 feet. Drawing isn't labeled, that's why I'm confused. I want to understand a little bit more since I'm not. Yeah, it, it would have helped. Yeah. Our screens. What's on the screen behind you um, is what we're proposing. It's 41.2 to, to the garage. And the one next is 53.5. Five, yes. And our house does step back some. I, I don't know how far back. But the idea was to try to meet it as the house moves closer to uh, the neighbor. Mm -hmm. 
This footprint is different a little bit than this footprint, and, but they look similar and that got me confused. Mm -hmm. So this is the one, the 41 feet. That has 58. It's not the rest same footprint. So uh, I wish we could look better up there. Okay. So is your concern the alignment, Ms. Karpinek, with the house, with the house to the right, and, and because we're coming 10 foot, 10 feet closer to the road, I guess. And when I looked at the aerial, it didn't seem like there was a house to the right. Mm -hmm. it, not to the right, maybe to the left. To the left. To the left. And it looked like on the site plan, you were close to the being in line with the house on the left. With the proposed, yes, we're trying to step back the enclosed Stepping space. Stepping back, so it's not a... The whole front facade is not at 41 feet. That's Stepping correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess we... I forgot the public hearing was closed. Sorry. No, oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the fine for that is only very, very minimal. <laughs> uh, so your, your, your concern was that the property to the left this was set back a little 10 feet further, but that's just the, that's not all of the building an issue, that's just part of it, and, and, and it steps back, so it sounds like very, that has satisfied you to some extent. Yes. Okay, all right. He's asking for the public hearing to be open. Well, I just have one. Would that be okay? Yeah, if you think, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So my understanding is when I put a site plan in front of this board, whatever you approve is fixed. Is that correct, Mr. Hargis? Or Try if, one more time. If I present a site plan to this board, mm -hmm. if they approve it, then that site plan is fixed. My building permit will be based on that exact dimensions and layout. Or further back. You, you couldn't come closer, but we would. our office would allow you to. Okay, my, my fear is that we get in front of the stormwater board and that portion in the very back that we're proposing over this, the buffer line, if they nix that and I have to pull, no, not, get rid of that piece. No, that, that for us wouldn't be an issue. Okay. Ours would be an issue if um, this board grants you a 41 foot setback and stormwater said, no, move it to 30. Oh, okay. And then okay. you're gonna come back here. Okay. okay. But no, that, that back there complies with the side. I just wanted to make sure I had a little wiggle room on the very back side. Okay. We're still open, right? Yes. In looking at this picture, the lower picture, where am I looking? I mean, is that... You were looking right into a tributary creek. Uh, the river is to the left. That's uh, what I thought. Yes. Okay, so it, it, it's sort of like if you've taken the front view of the property, it's on this side. There's nobody down past you. Nobody, nobody down past okay. me. There are structures there now, but it's Metro Water Services. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Mr. Cuthbertson, just one clarification. So if the board granted a 40, 41 foot setback, you got the stormwater and they made you move more of the front facade to 41, you're okay. Right? You're vested in the line, not necessarily the plan, unless the board says that plan. Okay. Uh, okay. Special exceptions are different, but variances are not. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Any further questions from the applicant, for the applicant? Okay, so we'll close the public hearing and discuss. I, uh, I was um, paying attention to Ms. Carpenter because of her architectural skills, and if she's satisfied, you're, sounds like you're satisfied with the alignment that was... Well, the alignment in the drawing, but I understand we'd be granting a, the setback to be 41 feet, and he could move the house a little bit closer Further. to the road, which would be a little bit more out of line with the, the structure right. that's next to it. Um, See, it seems like the, the street generally is a little bit out. Like it's not, you know, you've got kind of a pretty wide swing in the, the development pattern there from like 50 three to 81 or something like that, so.
Well, I mean, there, and there's definitely a, a hardship with respect to the, the floodway. I mean, there's no, we don't have to reach to find that. I mean, it, yeah. So I'm, um, I'll make a motion that we approve it. Second. So there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Okay. That passes. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chairman, before we adjourn, um, Mr. Bradford um, has something he wants to discuss. Yeah, I, just, I, I wanted to recognize Mr. Dickerson for his final meeting as our esteemed counsel and uh, thank him for his service to yeah. Metro. Yeah, I agree. And wish him, wish him uh, the best in his future endeavors, yeah. which may include shaving a beard, maybe not. Oh. Oh. Probably shaving the beard. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been an honor. Uh, so I would like to echo that as well. Uh, uh, Alex and I worked together the last year and a half or so, and I really appreciate his counsel, both as, as representing the Coast Department, uh, but appreciate his friendship, too. So wish you the best out there, sir. Uh, and keep the beard. I started joining you. I like it. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it, it survives 2020. It's really just out of jealousy. <laughs> I wish mine was less patchy. Yes, I, I agree. You're going to need to get some Jordans if you're going to... This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.